Hello, everyone. Um, hopefully you can you can hear me well. And uh, uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Chris Russell and I'm the National Director for Education here at Ofsted. Um, and really appreciate you signing up for this webinar and for taking the time to, to join us this afternoon. Um, because we know a lot of people out there are keen to talk about our work and about inspection and and that sometimes people get charged quite a lot for that and that the messages aren't always the right ones and that sometimes when people get wrong messages about inspection um, then that can sometimes create work so we wanted very much to create more opportunities to talk to you directly and for you to hear from us directly about our inspection work and today is the first of these live webinars um, and the focus today is about how the EIF, the Education Inspection Framework, uh, works in primary schools and we want to focus on really on key messages today um, and we want to talk about the kind of things that we know can sometimes cause confusion or, or concern uh, around aspects of our inspection work so you know for example you'll be hearing about deep dives and about subject leadership from us today etc and to be absolutely honest our aim is to reassure it's to talk about what we do to talk about inspection and hopefully by being clear about that and about talking about some of these key things that we know sometimes do cause a bit of confusion we hope that we can reduce at least some of the stress around inspection for people because there is a key message to be honest to all of this and that is that genuinely we don't want you to do things for us and you don't need to do things for us um, it's, you've got a very busy job to do and and you know actually what what you need to do what we want you to focus on is knowing your children uh, uh, and doing the right thing for them and actually my experience as an inspector always has been that actually where schools are doing that that absolutely shines through it in inspection and we hope that uh, what we're going to be able to talk about today will give you some reassurance about those things um, and today on the webinar, I've got a number of uh, colleagues with me. Um, as I say, I'm the National Director for Education. I lead the Education Directorate. And I've got two colleagues today. We're all HMI, we're all Her Majesty's Inspectors. We've all done a fair bit of inspection. I've got with me Jill Jones, who is the Deputy Director for Schools and Early Education. I've got Kirsty Godfrey, also, as I say, an HMI, who's a specialist advisor in the uh, Education Directorate. Um, but we've also got on the call, able to join at the last minute, so we're really grateful. Dan Lambert is also an HMI who works in the regions, works in the Southeast region, delivers inspections um, in, in the Southeast. Um, and we've also got on the call Anne Heavey. Anne Heavey also works in the Education Directorate and is going to be um, some Master of Ceremonies later on when we get to the, uh, the question and answer part. Um, just a little bit about how it works. The Education Directorate, which I lead, develops all the inspection policy, practice guidance that underpins all of our inspection work. Um, but we work very closely with inspectors in the regions um, who deliver those inspections. So there's obviously a close link between uh, the sort of setting of inspection policy and the delivery of in inspection on the ground. Okay, so thank you. If we could move to the next slide, please. And just the thing to reinforce here uh, is that we don't hide how we do things. We put all of our inspection documentation uh, on the internet for people to, to look at. And we also do a number of other things like blogs and press releases, etc. And what we try and do if we feel that there is perhaps an area that's causing a bit of confusion is we we sometimes for example try and put a blog out about it so that we can try and explain some of those key things so it's always worth looking looking out at the kind of things that we put out there but the important thing to stress is as we say that the guidance for inspectors what they use on inspection we don't keep it secret we put it all out there everybody can see exactly what uh, inspectors are using so moving on to the next slide The Education Inspection Framework, the EIF, we introduced in September 19 after a great deal of consultation and piloting, etc. But of course, uh, due to COVID, we uh, had to suspend our routine inspection work for quite a long period. So in effect, we've probably used this framework only for maybe a year over that period. Um, there, there are four 
um, key judgments, leadership and management, personal development, behavior and attitudes, and quality of education. Um, and feeding into those is uh, the, the early years judgment, uh, and the inspectors will take full account of early years provision when they make those four judgments. And of course, all of that adds up to the judgment for overall effectiveness. So moving on to the next slide. When we introduced the framework, um, we tested it very carefully and we, we piloted it fully. Uh, and we did that across all different kinds of schools to ensure that the EIF works well in all circumstances. And when we went back to routine inspection uh, and in September, we prior to that, we also tested again and piloted again to make sure that that was still the case um, with the sort of impact of COVID. And, and to reassure, under the EIF, all types of school are doing well. Um, you know, we are seeing strong outcomes from all types of school. And the thing to reinforce, I think, about the EIF is that it is about the substance of education. It is about um, how pupils build rich, deep body of knowledge, um, and therefore inspectors on the ground, on inspection, are interested in finding out about what pupils know, what they remember, and what they can do. Okay, so thanks for that. That's just really by way of introduction. What I'm going to do now is hand over to um, Jill Jones, who's going to talk a little bit about deep dives. Okay, thank you, Chris, and I, I hope that you can hear me. Um, and uh, thank you everyone who's joined this webinar, probably after the end of a, a long school day. And I always think that the weekend that the clocks spring forward is always uh, slightly harder on the Monday morning to, to uh, get into a routine. Uh, so I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about what we're looking at on deep dives in primary schools. And the word deep dives is, is just to represent the methodology that we use to get to the heart of the quality of education judgment. And that, uh, the, the activities that uh, take place during a deep dive are there to ensure that we can get to the heart of the effectiveness of the school's curriculum, the delivery of that curriculum and the impact that it has ultimately on children's achievement. So it's a, a set of protocols that we use as inspectors to ensure consistency and uh, for some reason we came up with the term deep dives. So on to the next slide. Um, this slide sets out essentially what we do during a deep dive. So it sets out our inspection process and for each judgment we make we collect, we connect and we evaluate evidence. The process whether is the same for all judgment areas. Um, however, with our quality of education judgment, we call the process of collecting and connecting um, a deep dive. So let's start at the beginning of that process. So it starts with our inspectors contacting the school and having a, a a conversation with school leaders which we call a top level view of the curriculum and so the top level view is for uh, the um, leaders of the school to talk to us about the curriculum for all the pupils in school from the youngest to the oldest and it's important to note here that inspectors don't have a preferred curriculum model they build the top level view through their pre-inspection analysis, so looking at the data that's published in the school's IDSR, and then in what we call an educationally focused conversation that we'll have with school leaders on the day before the inspection begins. And from that conversation, one of the things that the lead inspector and the head teacher will agree on is which subjects the inspection team or the inspector, if it's a small school, will carry out uh, as deep dives. So through our deep dives, we collect and connect evidence of how a school's curriculum um, delivers a high quality education for all its pupils. And then we bring that together with any further evidence that we collect along the way to come to our judgment. So moving on to the next 
slide. In a primary school, depending on its size, inspectors will typi typically carry out between three and five deep dives. And it's important to be clear that a deep dive in itself is not a subject inspection. We look at a selection of subjects as a means of getting to the heart of the quality of education, of what things are common across subjects and which things are, are uh, different. And so the focus of each deep dive is to find out whether pupils are learning the knowledge that they need to achieve the goals of their education and exploring how pupils gain more knowledge as they travel through the school from their start in the early years to when they leave in year six. So it's really important to understand at, during those conversations what it is that schools intend schools to children to learn and how well it is when we're looking at the subjects happening in classrooms, how well children are learning uh, that, that knowledge. So by looking at a selection of subjects through deep dives, inspectors then identify the common strengths and any areas that need working on. And then they'll have further conversations to see if any weaknesses are significant or widespread or if they're relatively minor. And, and those decisions will be made in conversation with school leaders. And so you may have seen this slide before. This, this slide captures the, the process or the protocols that inspectors use during a deep dive. So the deep dive starts in, with the picture in blue, with the educationally converse, uh, focused conversation with senior leaders on the day before the inspection begins. Um, and the inspector will ask questions about the structure of the school, the context of the school, and the organization of the curriculum within these um, conversations. And that's really important in primary schools because we know that primary schools vary hugely in size and complexity. And it's very different when we inspect a primary school that has maybe three teachers in it, one of whom would be the head teacher, and a primary school that may be a three or four form entry primary school as large as a small secondary school. So that context in the first part of the conversation is really important. So as early as possible, when we get to inspect on the school site, we then go um, into the next part of, of this diagram and we'll meet with relevant leaders to discuss the content and sequencing within the deep dive of subjects. So these meetings, usually starting with the head teacher, but then perhaps involving some curriculum leads or phase leads or however the school may uh, organize its, itself, these, these meetings help us to get a sense of the big picture, what it is the school is intending to achieve. And we understand if the subject isn't an area of specialism for the leader. Um, in fact, quite a lot of us on this call have actually been primary school teachers and head teachers ourselves. And we know what it's like to have to teach a subject that you're not expert in and that you haven't um, sometimes had much training in and how important CPD is to enable us to get better at teaching that subject. So what matters most is what you're doing in school and what you want pupils to learn and why. And we also have no view about who may lead a subject. We know that in primary schools, people wear many, many hats. So when we have that subject focused conversation, we want to meet with whoever is best placed to talk to us about what's in that curriculum in that subject. Um, so that maybe um, that it will be more than one person in primary schools. Often people share subject leads. It may sit with the senior leadership or the head teacher themselves. We really don't mind. It, it, it's for you to um, decide who is most suitable to talk to inspectors. So then throughout the first day of inspection, we'll carry out other deep dive activities such as lesson visits, discussion with teachers, talking to pupils, looking at pupils' work. And we want to emphasize that the lesson visits in a deep dive are not there to judge the quality of teaching. They're there to look at 
how you're implementing the curriculum, what part of the curriculum you, you're teaching and how much uh, time you give to children to learn the things that you want them to learn. So we don't look at teaching separately from the cur curriculum. Teaching is just a means of delivering that curriculum and that's what we want to look at, the curriculum in action. So inspectors will often invite a school leader to visit lessons with them and this again can be whoever the school wishes, whether it's the curriculum leader or the head teacher, for example. You'll also notice that on this diagram, there are purple arrows that connect each part of the deep dive. They represent the inspector's thinking as they carry out the deep dive activities. So what inspectors are asking themselves as they carry out the activities it are things like, so what does this part of the picture tell me? How does it fit with what else I've found out so far? And what more do I need to do to assure myself that I've got enough information to evaluate how well that subject is contributing to the quality of inspection, of, of um, education overall? So, Notice how all the time the inspector on this diagram will be connecting back to the top level view, connecting what they are finding out back to what the head teacher told them in the original phone call. And then the inspector will be asking themselves, so how does this stack up with leaders view of the strengths and weaknesses of the curriculum? So it's an ongoing process, a protocol that inspectors use so that we make sure that we look at all aspects of a school's work to get to the quality of education as a whole. So moving on to the next slide. In practice, what we always do is to work to understand the structure of the school, the context of the, the aspects that the school is working on in. And it's particularly important in that conversation to understand the impact that COVID is having on, on you, both currently and previously. And so we'll always be flexible and pragmatic about the readings, the, the meetings we need to hold, because we want to work with you to ensure that staff are not overburdened so that what we do on inspection is helpful for you so that we can uh, have a conversation, a dialogue about what's going well and what needs uh, further work on. We'll understand that on inspection it might not be possible to do everything in a small school in particular in the way that we might in a larger one. For example, we won't expect to see a particular number of lessons being taught in the deep dive subjects. Inspectors will always work with the school's timetable and visit the lessons that are available. And if we can't see lessons in some subjects or some parts of the school, we'll gather evidence in different ways, such as by speaking with more pupils or by looking at books or ev other evidence that the school may have um, to, to make sure that we have enough coverage. But the best big message here for you is that we want to see your school in action as it usually is. You know, we want to see it working in the way that it always works. So don't do anything in preparation for inspection that is not part of what routinely happens in your school or that you want to work on. The big message is don't do it for Ofsted. So, I also want to just say a few things about the early years because there's been a lot of talk and debate about um, inspectors asking to see um, evidence of geography being taught in the early years or evidence of um, uh, DT being taught in the early years. And what we want to make clear is that inspectors are asking about the areas of learning in the early years, the seven areas of learning. So inspectors will always visit the early years as part of deep dives to understand how pupils gain the knowledge they need from the start of their time in school. But this doesn't mean that they expect to see the national curriculum subjects being taught in the early years. What inspectors will be looking at is how the early years prepares pupils for the next stage, year one and beyond. So this slide shows the three aspects 
that inspectors will consider when they're looking in at the early years. They'll look at the areas of learning, what's being taught at the moment. They'll ask about the seven areas of learning and how um, in schools are working towards ensuring that children have the, the knowledge of the content of those areas of learning that they need. As well, when inspectors are in early years, they'll be looking at the quality of interaction. So inspectors will particularly be looking at the, the dialogue that's going on between adults and children, the role modeling that adults do, and the conversations that they'll be having with children to understand how well children are making progress, in particular in their language and communication. And we'll look at the way that adults develop children's vocabulary and comprehension, generally seeing how adults help children to learn and remember the important knowledge and skills that help them uh, to use more words. And then we'll be looking at the deliberate intentions. So we'll want to understand how well teachers ensure that children make progress in all seven areas of learning. But inspectors won't be looking for files full of assessment evidence on individual children or photographs or post-it notes that record children's progress. We'll look at deliberate intentions through the conversations we have with leaders and with early years staff. Since September 2019, we've been really clear that we won't look at schools' internal data assessment or tracking when on inspection. And we hope this will help you because we are really keen that we don't add to um, teachers' burdens, workloads. And instead, teach, uh, inspectors will find out about the what you intend children to learn by talking to you about the environment, the routines that you put in place, and how you implement the curriculum. So finding out what children know from teachers and what they need to learn next and how well the activities and environments are structured to help children to practice and reinforce their learning. So really important to uh, understand the early years as the start of the child's um, time in school and the, the, uh, the time where the good routines and protocols for the rest of their, their, their school life can be set in place. And so um, I'm really pleased now to be able to hand over to Dan, who's come in at the last minute to support us with this webinar. And you're going to talk about subject leadership in primary schools, Dan. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jill. Yeah, over the next couple of slides, um, we'd really like to clarify our, our expectations around subject leadership uh, in primary schools. And we get asked a lot of questions about this. So I, I, I really do hope it, uh, hope it helps colleagues that, that are designing curriculums in primary. We know that in a lot of primary schools, staff wear a, a huge number of hats. Uh, and, and that for, for many colleagues, they will be uh, there'll be subject leaders in a number of areas and we know that in some schools it'll be the head teacher who oversees all of the subjects possibly uh, it's, it, you know it often isn't uh, possible or realistic uh, to develop detailed expertise in in multiple subject areas and we don't expect you to what's really important is that as a collective staff give really careful thought uh, to the content that they want pupils to be taught to learn and ultimately to remember to overcome the challenges and expertise of multiple curriculum areas, lots of schools work with other local schools to design their curriculums. Schools often make use of schemes and work that are developed by subject specialists, and Ofsted doesn't, uh, does not consider it necessary for schools to design their curriculums all by themselves. We understand that very often looking outside of your school gates uh, will, will, will bear enormous fruit. Whatever it is you do, however it is that you approach curriculum design, it hasn't got to be all singing and all dancing. Your curriculum just needs to be ambitious and coherent. So what does that look like in practice? Well, we're not expecting subject leaders to be subject specialists. They don't need a postgraduate qualification in their subject area. They just need to be able to lead and develop the curriculum in that subject. What we do expect is for leaders to have an overview of the whole subject from the early years to year six 
Uh, and I think that's a really important point, just building on what Jill Jones uh, has, has just mentioned there. The early years is not a secret garden. It doesn't sit behind a beaded curtain. So we will ask you during during uh, those those discussions about a subject, about the curriculum from, from year R to year six. Um, we will be interested to know how senior leaders are supporting non-subject specialists to develop their knowledge, their knowledge of the subject, to help them carry out their role with confidence, understanding that that subject leadership will be part of that teacher's wider role very often. For instance, joint subject associations and working with clusters of school, uh, of other schools, uh, are very common examples of ways that schools have overcome this challenge of size and capacity. During the inspection phone call, we'll always ask the head teacher or senior leaders who is the best person or people to talk to about the subjects uh, that, that, that we're looking at in the deep dives. And it's absolutely appropriate, and I think it's such an important point, absolutely appropriate for a senior leader to join that conversation as well. This isn't about saying you're the subject leader, we need to meet you, you know, on your own. Uh, if a, if a, a head teacher or another senior leader wishes to join, you are very, very welcome to do so. I'm now going to hand over to Kirsty to talk about early reading. Thank you, Dan. So early reading, well, the education inspection framework places a strong emphasis on early reading. And so I'm now going to highlight why reading, reading is given this close attention and also what it means for inspection. So we know how important it is that schools teach reading well from the start because reading is the gateway to learning in other subjects. And we know that reading opens doors, enjoyment, academic success, and lifelong opportunity. Now, pupils who struggle with phonics can quickly fall behind their peers. They read less than others, and so do not accumulate knowledge and vocabulary from their own reading. Pupils who cannot read accurately and speedily are likely to struggle in every subject which requires them to read and write. And this is because fluency in word reading, spelling and handwriting are essential in allowing pupils to focus on understanding what they read or composing a piece of writing. Now, research has found that being able to read accurately by age six has a strong correlation with future academic success. And those who fall behind in the early years typically continue to do so for the rest of their education. We know there are too many pupils and, and probably more, uh, many more as a result of the pandemic who are still not reading age appropriate books fluently by the time they reach key stage two. So for them and for pupils of any age who are still in those early stages of learning to read, then learning to read must be an essential priority. And that's why it's important for schools and for Ofsted to place our attention on making sure that all pupils learn to read as soon as they should. Focusing on getting reading right from the beginning will give all children the best possible start in their education. So what does that mean for inspection? Well, in every school where there are primary aged pupils, inspectors will carry out an early reading deep dive. We will use the early reading evaluation criteria to check how well all pupils learn to read. And these criteria can be found in section three of our school inspection handbook, paragraphs 349 to 351. When we carry out our deep dive activities, we will focus on the lowest 20% of pupils. And that is because it's so important that these pupils are getting the right support to help them catch up quickly. Paying close attention to the lowest 20% of pupils also allows us to identify improvements that will benefit every pupil. We will select a sample of these pupils from years one to three and listen to them read. We'll ask to hear them read from an unseen book, which is at the right stage for them. And Ofsted doesn't have a preference about which phonics program a school chooses to use. What is important is how well the program is being implemented and the impact it has on how well all pupils do learn to read. And there's no Ofsted requirement to use a validated program. However, 
for schools needing to improve their practice, then validated programmes are likely to provide the most effective options to choose from. And I'm now going to hand over to Anne, who's going to take us into the questions and answers part of the session. Oh, thanks so much, Kirsty. Um, can I just start by saying thank you to everyone that sent a question in advance of the session? Um, we had a lot, um, which has been really helpful for planning the session, um, and everyone that's been messaging during the session. We've had quite a few, so we're going to do our best to get through them. Um, and I just wanted to highlight, as you can see on your screen, we have got some other webinars penciled in. Um, so questions that relate to these topics, we're going to save for those webinars. Um, but again, you, you can sign up and get the recordings. Um, so, so you can kind of pick them up then. Um, and we're also noting that there are some other big themes coming up, for example, safeguarding. So we may plan other future webinars to pick up some of those big um, topics that you're also interested in. Um, so I can see you're still putting questions in, so I'm going to try and work them in bear with me. Um, but I'm going to start um, with a question uh, for Jill, if that's OK. Um, so if a school has a thematic or topic based curriculum for their foundation subjects, what does that mean for deep dives? OK, that's a really good question, because lots of lots of primary schools um, approach the curriculum in that way. What it simply means is that uh, in order to, do, to teach any subject, the content of that subject must be defined so that you know what you're teaching. And so it doesn't actually meet, matter to us how you organize uh, your curriculum. So whether you do it in themes, whether and, you, know, you might do it as a rolling two-year program or whatever, uh, depending on, on um, the, the, the nature of your school. But the important thing for you and for inspection, I suppose, is to have identified what you want taught and what you want children to learn through that teaching in the particular subject. So you might group subjects together, but you would still need to identify the knowledge that you expect children to learn. And that's, that's the important thing. So it really doesn't matter how you implement it. It's knowing what you want children to learn that's the key. Super, thanks, Jill. Um, Dan, I'm going to come to you if that's OK. Um, so um, really good question. Um, how would a deep dive work in a multi site setting? So um, for context, the person answering this um, works in a school that operates across five sites. Um, so there's a lot of geography involved. Um, how, how would an inspector decide where to go and how to make that work? I mean, I think the main thing here is it starts with a conversation with yourself. Uh, it may be, you know, if we're talking a, a deep dive specifically, if we're looking at a certain a certain subject area, we need to know, you know, where that subject might be taught over the next couple of days. We want to know uh, which year groups are, are going to be to go, going to be learning that. Where the where the subject leader uh, might be based during that day as well. So inspectors are always very happy to uh, to, to to drive uh, to, to different sites to to have a look at, at what is happening. And of course, the careful planning around that is is the most important thing. So it's it's probably more common than you think for inspectors to to move across different sites. And really, we we just ask for your help in in getting that organised. Yeah, excellent. In larger schools, there'll be more than one inspector on one subject, won't there? So it, it may be that we would split the subject between um, inspectors in instances like that as well. But as you say, it's that first conversation. Thanks, Jill. Kirsty, um, we've got a lot about reading, so I was wondering if we could come to you for a few. Um, so, um, like I said, a lot, but we'll start with, um, if a school has just started to use a new phonics programme, um, how would that factor in an inspection? OK, so we understand that actually that will be the case for many schools at the moment, given the validation process and people have been thinking about what their phonics programme, whether it's providing them the most effective, high quality um, resources and training as, it, as others do. So we obviously will take that into account. We'll ask leaders about their you know, their rationale for making the changes and we'll find out where they're up to with the implementation. Perhaps, for example, staff are only just becoming familiar with it and, and maybe they're only part of the way through the training. So we'll take those things into account when we carry out our deep dive activities. But of course, ultimately, we use those evaluation criteria for early reading that I mentioned earlier. And that's what will help us check 
how effective the school have been in teaching all pupils to learn to read. And so it's not just the here and now, it's not just what's happening that week um, when something might be very new, but of course, over the period of time since the last inspection. And we'll see that when we're hearing those pupils that are older um, reading. Thanks, Kirsty. Um, if I could follow up, we've had a lot of questions um, about um, older pupils or pupils with an identification of SEND who um, are still in those early stages of reading um, and an interest about how we also look at reading in specialist settings. So I was wondering if you could maybe share some thoughts about that and offer some reassurance. Yeah, I think the most important thing here is that when when anybody learns to read they need to have an understanding of the alphabetic code and that's phonics um, and there is no choice about that you know if we are going to be independent readers and spellers we all need to have that knowledge those grapheme phoneme correspondences so a systematic synthetic phonics program is something that should be used for all pupils regardless of whether that's in mainstream or in some specialist provision obviously there will be some pupils who have you know profound and multiple conditions and complex um, special educational needs where things may need to be considered in terms of the pedagogy to get across that same curriculum content. Perhaps they need things breaking down into smaller steps and they will possibly need a lot more repetition of that same knowledge until it becomes really um, secure and fluent. But ultimately, it's that same knowledge. Um, it's just that different children will be at a different point within that journey of learning phonics. Can I, can I just add there, Anne, as well? I mean, one of the reasons that we put um, early reading at the heart of the um, EIF is because actually without being able to read, you re children really struggle to access the rest of the curriculum. And I know as a primary head, I often struggled with, so, so how do I find time for the children that, are that need far more practice than other children to get onto that reading ladder? How do I prioritize that? Because you know there is only a finite time in the day, however many hours you teach in the week, and you know something has to be has to be prioritized and and so if you're making those difficult decisions about when do we find the time to teach children to read i think you have to reverse that question and say what happens to those children if we don't find the time to teach them to read because ofsted will be more concerned if you haven't prioritized reading in primary schools than it that it will um the other way around if that makes sense and i think that's particularly important um you know because the pandemic will have created a huge variation in in children's um uh, uh, knowledge of reading and without being able to read really you know the rest of the world becomes very difficult for them so uh, prioritize it it has to be the number one thing um we have a lot coming in on reading so i'm going to ask at least two more now and then i'm going to come back to you down for some subject leadership stuff if that's okay to give you a warning um kirsty back to you um we've got a question about whether um books for beginner readers always need to match um, a pupil's phonetic knowledge? Yeah, I, it is really important that the books only include those grapheme phoneme correspondences that have been taught and also those common exception words that have been introduced at that point by that point in time. And that's because it allows us then to isolate that knowledge that's been taught and provide an opportunity to practice it so that children can you know, be accurate, and they can read every word, but importantly, they can beat up, build up that bank of words that they can read at a glance and, and become more fluent with their reading. But of course, in those early stages of learning to read, there, there may be books that are used for different purposes. So I don't want to um, just give the impression that there are only books that children use for decoding practice, because there are also the books that children will hear being read to them that will develop that understanding of language and also that love of reading. And in the early stages, the same books, highly unlikely to be able to achieve both of those aims. So, so really in those early stages, it's about books for developing language are the ones that are read to the child, whereas those books for decoding practice should be read by the child and should reflect that taught um, phonic knowledge. 
Thanks, Kirsty. I promise this will be my last one for a moment. <laughs> okay. um, um, to you. Um, um, a lot of questions around this next one. Um, so how will we assess reading for non-verbal pupils, perhaps with highly complex needs, um, who are not yet accessing subject specific learning? Yeah, I mean, again, I think it's important to say that it, it, it's a journey, isn't it? That curriculum is the same for all pupils, but some will be at a much earlier stage on that same journey than their peers. So it might be in terms of their receptive and expressive communication. So I think one before pupils get to the point of being able to learn phonics, then communication and language would be our focus. And that's what we would look at regardless of the subject. Thank you so much. Um, Dan, we've had a lot of um, questions about um, subject leadership and in particular how it manifests in school, small schools. So, for example, um, we've had questions about from schools where there are very few teachers, perhaps as few as two or three, um, and they obviously have multiple roles and, and, and teach a full timetable. How do we take that into account on inspection? I mean, absolutely. And, 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 you know, hats off to those colleagues that are running, you know, so many different subjects. I think the thing that always strikes me with small schools is they have all the same responsibilities of larger schools with fewer people to do it. Um, so, you know, I, I think the, the, you know, the really important bit to say here is we, you know, we want to start by talking to you, understanding what the scope of your role is, what the challenges of your role are, what things you really think you've gotten right. And, and you know, that, those are always the best bits to hear about as well. You know, what do you think is working really well? Um, when we talk to you, we, you know, we don't run on a deficit model. We want to know what's going well. We want to know what you're still working on as well. Um, and, and in every school we go to, I think, you know, the key bit is we, we do expect schools to have considered what they intend pupils to learn and broadly in what order as well, um, and that they can tackle this in a number of ways. As I mentioned earlier, it's not uncommon to find sc small school leaders that have benefited greatly from broadening and look, you know, looking, uh, looking outside of the school gate and working with other leaders, not because those other leaders are necessary experts, but they say, actually, I've got people I can tackle this together with, and they work together and collaborate and share uh, the things that have gone well and share, you know, share some of their learning as well as they've gone. I've met so many primary leaders this, uh, you know, in these last couple of years who've relished that opportunity. Um, and I've been bowled over with their passion and enthusiasm uh, as they, you know, as they bring about, you know, real curriculum change in their schools. It's exciting and a real privilege to see. Um, I, I really would flag up the subject is the associations as well here uh, and working with those national associations uh, who've really been putting that expertise and thinking and some of, some of the best minds in that particular subject area. Um, and these are organisations that that you can tap into uh, and work with to, to gain a greater understanding of those subject areas. Um, and, and I think I think the other bit to mention here uh, for senior and subject leaders is I think it's really key that you will be wearing a number of hats and we know that uh, and we'll speak to you from the, you know from the start but it's an ongoing conversation I need to be clear about that um, you know day, day plans change and that's why we all work in schools because they're wonderful unique and sometimes unpredictable uh, and that's the joy of them um, so we want to do you know we want to do our work with minimal disruption to the school we understand that whilst we're inspecting the work of the school continues um, um, and so those things like school fates, performances, parents' evening trips, visitors, please make sure they still go ahead. Please make sure they still go ahead. And senior leaders, particularly head teachers here, if you need to go out, meet the parents, of course, go and do that. We can work the timetable around you to make sure all of those things uh, still happen and you still get to uh, get to make sure all, the, all those important aspects of, of, uh, of the work uh, happen during the inspection as well. Thanks, Dan. Um, if I could follow up um, with a question that a few people have asked. So um, especially if a subject lead is new in post and is getting up to speed and, and perhaps hasn't actually studied the subject to a high level, um, would we ever refuse to allow a senior leader to um, join that subject lead for any, any elements of the inspection that they might be involved in? I mean, refuse refuse would be an interesting one. Uh, I think I think what we sometimes ask um, senior leaders to do is to step away if we're asking questions about safeguarding, uh, and that's not to catch anyone out. We just want to know what those members of staff understand about safeguarding independently from their designated safeguarding lead, for example. We'll also ask about workload. 
I wouldn't want my my line manager to be in a in a discussion if I was talking about my personal circumstances and my workload, and that's certainly not a dig at my line manager, I promise you. Uh, but but we we will often do that to make sure that uh, make sure that those staff have have the sort of privacy, courtesy, and dignity uh, to to speak about sensitive things that are important to them, and and you know that that's really key. Likewise with pupils, we will often speak to, to, to them uh, with, without uh, senior leaders or, or members of staff present, with the exception that those uh, those pupils that need it to help them communicate. So it would be unusual to do that. Um, so I think refuse would probably be a, a very strong way of putting it. It would, it would need to be with good reason. And, and I like to think the inspector would have the discussion with the head teacher about why that might be the case, if you see what I mean. It's certainly not something in my sort of six, seven years of inspecting that I've ever needed to do during a subject. Uh, discussion and certainly never during EIF. Thank you. Um, again, kind of considering support and advice for new and post subject leads, is there any specific paperwork that you would require or expect to see on inspection? Nothing at all. Very often, I, I I did start off inspecting, thinking I should bring a, a set of scales because often an enormous folder comes in with the subject leader, uh, and we all do that. We all have, you know, I've 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 got my I've got my slides here ready as my comfort blanket. But actually, when those subject leaders start talking, nine times out of ten, their eyes light up as they can't wait to tell me about about the you know the the real focus of their work over the last couple of years, and it's a real joy to listen to. Uh, but of course, feel free to bring in those plans. Talk us through your curriculum. Talk us through uh, things that you've been doing. And uh, but in terms of specific paperwork, uh, other than what you would normally use. We don't need to see. We don't need to, to see anything in particular, and certainly nothing that would be produced uh, for us in in any way, shape, or form. So just the you know the plans that you would you would use to make sure all staff have that kind of unified understanding of which bit am I responsible for, what am I building on, and what am I building towards uh, is, is normally normally useful. But however that looks, it, it 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 doesn't it doesn't matter. It's whatever works for your school. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, Jill, we're going to come back to you if that's okay. Um, and I, I've, I feel very mean using this word, but um, I'm, I'm sure you'll forgive me. Um, we've had a few questions about um, how inspectors will be using the 2022 SATs data, um, given everything that schools and pupils have been through over the past couple of years. Yeah, that's a really good question. And I, I noticed that it was in the news um, over the weekend, so very topical as well. Um, it's very difficult for children at the moment who've had a very um, disrupted schooling to know that they're facing SATs. In fact, I had a, um, a, a, a text from a friend of mine whose granddaughter is um, preparing uh, or being prepared for SATs at the moment. And I think the interesting thing about our education inspection framework is that we have changed the conversation about um, education. And so, of course, it's important that, that government is able to say what the national standards are. I don't think anyone would disagree that knowing uh, having national benchmarks uh, is, is an important part of, of education. But, uh, but those benchmarks shouldn't be the driver of what children are taught to the extent that actually their whole experience of the curriculum is narrowed. Um, so what we do through our education inspection framework, through our subject deep dives, is we look at progress through the curriculum. You, you set out what you intend children to learn and children make progress in learning what it is that you've set out. And that's the conversation that we'll be having. Obviously, the SATs are in um, reading, the SATs are in um, English and, and in maths, so that will play into the conversation, but it is the end of the conversation, not the whole. And we've totally changed the focus in reading into early reading, because we know that actually uh, it's really important that children learn to read early on so that they can build their knowledge across all subjects and that they, they succeed um, across all subjects. So we're no longer just looking and we won't be just looking at the outcomes in, in year six to, to say, well, okay, so you know what's gone wrong with your curriculum? That's not the conversation that we'll be having at all. It starts from your planning of the curriculum, your implementation of it, and the impact is what children have learned out of 
from what you've intended them to learn. So um, I think we'll see in our inspection framework um, a, a very realistic understanding of, of the place of SATs and how you are approaching them as a school. So please don't worry about what Ofsted is going to be saying. Um, we, we really understand the context within which you're working. And I can see Dan nodding, who's an inspector on the ground. Um, so important. I'm just thinking, Jill, at no point in my career have I ever thought, actually, the, the evidence that I've gathered, gathered on the school, the contemporaneous, this current evidence that I've got here, and I'm considering towards the end of inspection, I've never thought that has been outweighed by an IDSR that's out of date. Um, and, and so it's just to reassure colleagues, I'll look at it. Of course I will. It tells me lots about your context. It tells me a lot about uh, about how children are, are you know, reading, writing, counting, all of the things that Jill says. But it's not contemporaneous evidence. It's not current evidence. What's actually happening in your school is, is the most important bit. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I'm certainly uh, I'm certainly never put under pressure or, or influenced by that in an undue way. I think uh, I think Chris's predecessor, predecessor uh, Sean Harford, mentioned it. You know, it's a signpost, not a destination. Yeah. And it's, I just want one more thing and very, very quickly, it's so important that children actually make progress through the curriculum, particularly in reading, particularly in writing, that those things are, are worked on from the beginning um, rather than a mad rush at the end to, to gather some um, knowledge that perhaps uh, is not secure. So get them secure in, in their learning, De determine what it is you want them to learn, make sure you're clear on that. I'm going to come back to you, Kirsty, if that's OK. So we've had at least half a dozen people ask this um, next one, um, which is um, how will inspectors respond to a school prioritising reading interventions if that means pupils are coming out of foundation subjects? Is that something that a school will be penalised for? Well, I think Jill's already mentioned that reading has to be a priority because if children can't read fluently, um, age appropriate reading material, then they're not able to benefit from that full curriculum. So it needs to be a priority so that they can access their learning because of course, otherwise, not only will their reading suffer if it's not addressed and that gap will widen between them and their peers, but also that subject knowledge that they're gaining from all those other subjects, they, they won't be able to access those subjects and, and achieve as well in them either. So both things suffer. So yeah, reading has to be a priority. What we know though from some leaders is that they've told us about really um, effective ways of managing the fact that children will need to miss something else. And so some schools have told us how they rotate the subject so that children don't miss the same subject every single week or every day um, or they might be creative in the use of time so that pupils come in slightly earlier just before registration and, and have some intervention time then so there are ways around it because we know we still want children to have that experience of those broad range of subjects because that will help that understanding of vocabulary and the concepts that will help them when they are able to read well to understand what it is that they read thanks Kirsty. go on just jump in there because I remember the nightmare of um, peripatetic music teaching um, when I was ahead and trying to um, organise which lessons children came out of for their violin lessons or their trumpet lessons and things like that and it really is about making decisions as a head about what's best for the group of children that you've got in front of you at that point in time so you know it's not for us as Ofsted to determine that but Obviously, we'll have a conversation with you about why you've made those choices. And we would hope that, you know, you, those those choices that you make are about prioritising what is best for those pupils at that point in time. So if a child has missed um, learning to read because of COVID, then yes, get them in, you know, catch them up quickly. Because if you don't, then they're going to miss everything else further on as well. And they're just going to struggle throughout their, their schooling. Thanks, Jill. Um, we're coming to the end of time. So I think if we're good, we can answer two more questions. And Chris, I'm going to come to you for the last one. Um, but I thought it'd be useful to say we will see all the questions that you've put in. So we might um, issue um, some, some further um, responses to any we couldn't cover today. Um, and we will put on more sessions, including the ones that you can already see on the screen. Um, so 
we're not ignoring your questions if we haven't been able to answer them. You're just providing us with so many great ones, we can't get through them all. So, Jill, is it true that Ofsted expects a summative assessment at the end of each curriculum topic? I'll be quick. No. I thought not. No. <laughs> no, we don't expect anything. I mean, do do what you need. Don't do it for Ofsted. Some assessment is really important, such as, you know, if you're teaching phonics, which uh, GPCs uh, do children know? You you know, you would need that as a teacher, but not a summative assessment at the end of each um, thing. No, not for us. Thanks, Jill. And Chris, this, this is a bit similar. Is it true that Ofsted expects, if not requires, schools to conduct mock deep dives? Absolutely not. And, and you know, we would suggest that people don't do that. I mean, hopefully what people have got through the webinar today is, is a kind of, you know, a clear and realistic understanding of how we inspect quality of education, how we use deep dives and what we're trying to do through through that mechanism. And we, we you know, we absolutely don't suggest that that people use that as 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 a kind of thing that they do themselves or they bring people in to do that and so on. That is that is not what we suggest. You know, it comes back to what a lot of what we've said today really do you know if you're if you're interested in i don't know history and how how history the history curriculum is working out in your school do what you need to do to get underneath that and and look at it for your purposes but don't try and do a deep dive because the deep dive is a different thing it has a specific role it's not a subject inspection as jill said it is it is a way of looking at an element of the curriculum to get the whole picture on inspection Thanks, Chris. Um, I think we'll call it a day for the questions there as we've got to time. Um, are there any closing remarks that Jill, Chris, you would like to, to make? I mean, just perhaps just to say very quickly, I mean, again, a thank you for, for people joining today and to my colleagues for, for presenting and looking at the questions and so on. And we really do hope that people have got those key messages particularly about um, not trying to do things which people think are for inspection because actually what we're interested in is, you know, you knowing your children and you deciding and doing the right things for them and and that as i said at the beginning that shines through on inspection and hopefully we've been able to particularly to clarify some of those things about deep dives and very importantly i think about um you know the, about subjects and subject leadership and so on because we know that uh, some reassurance was was needed and hopefully it's been helpful there and absolutely to reiterate however you work that in your school you know we're not trying to catch anybody out there if we're coming in to find about find out about a subject however you do it we're happy to talk to whoever and that might be one person it might be a group of people it might be the head teacher um, and what we don't want to do is is put off anybody taking those kind of roles in subject leadership etc um, so hopefully um, we've been able to provide some reassurance around the sort of areas that we've that we've talked about today. I mean, as we said earlier, we have future uh, webinars coming up. I think also some of those questions, certainly looking at them coming through, and we've got through a fair number, but inevitably not all of them. But it's probably prompted some thoughts for us about other materials that we might usefully put out there, and possibly other webinars as well that we might focus. Um, so, so thank you for those questions. But that's all from me, Jill. I don't know if you wanted to add anything before we finish. Uh, just uh, thank you for, for joining us um, on your uh, Monday after the weekend and if you know do keep in touch with us and let us know if there are things that you would uh, like further webinars on because we we want to be able to talk directly with you like this so that you can hear it um, from I was going to say the hot the horse's mouth but I, I mean Ofsted's mouth so that would be better so thank you very much yes thanks Chris Thanks. Thanks, Anne.